Welcome to True Crime 101 with Murder Friends, the podcast where three friends from three different countries talk murder. My name my name's Anna, and I'm American. I'm Alana, and I'm Canadian. My name's Hannah, and I'm British. In addition to our longer episodes, True Crime 101 talks you through key true crime cases and theories. Always think I'm going to mess up at the end there, but I didn't. I messed up on my own name today. <laughs> Winning. All right, so... Today, I'm going to talk to you about one badass woman named Melinda Elkins. All right, so in Hannah's like previous True Crime 101, 101, it sort of reminded me of this story, and you guys may have heard of it because it has, it's been told a lot of places, but um, I've done a pretty deep dive, and it's a really good story um, because it has actually, well, as good of an ending as you can have with a story like this. Um, so Melinda is not the victim um, in our story, and she is not the killer. So let me start from the beginning. Ooh, intrigued. Yes. So now I'm going to tell you this little back information, and it's not like it doesn't relate directly to the crime, but it does sort of come into play, and it's just like another element of this like insane story. So we're going to take you back to 1950s, 1960s America. Um, There's a doctor called Thomas Hicks, and he is a doctor in McKaysville, Georgia. Now, he sold babies out of the back door of his office. Um, As part of his practice, Hicks performed abortions, which were illegal at the time. But sometimes when women came to him for an abortion, he instead would talk them into carrying the child. And then he would take the infants and sell them on the black market for $100 to $1,000. Oh, now they would I know they would be sold to couples who couldn't afford like traditional methods of adoption. So obviously it still is, it's expensive, it takes a long time. Um you also back then you could be rejected like for adoption if you were divorced or if you didn't own a home. I don't know if that's any different now, but I imagine it's maybe those are kind of like old old um criteria. So he sold nearly 200 babies this way, um, and most of the families were just, like, clueless. That, like, the people who were adopting them didn't realize, like, it was so dark, like, what was happening, right? Did you say 200 babies? 200. 200. Crikey. Now, there was even some evidence that he actually told some of the birth parents babies that they died when they were born, and then he sold them to, like, that. that's just... That's fucking I, grim. That's when it gets, like, really dark. Sorry, can I just, can you, you're just going to have to edit this out, but Piers Morgan just got canceled. Really? I saw he walked off his show. He got, he had been having oh, a meltdown. Oh, he's such a little bitch. Yeah. yeah sorry. We should just keep all of this Actually, thing. let's just keep it all in. <laughs> my friend is like, I can feel it on my watch, like being like, oh my God, because we've been talking about it like all day. And then she's like, he's gone. He's gone. Anyway, sorry. Good, because he's a racist piece of shit. He's awful. He's like gross. And he, I don't know, I can't believe he hasn't, like he just hasn't been gone yet. Anyway. Let's take it back to the babies, okay? <laughs> back in the room. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so this was like some really dark shit, you know. Okay, so Judy, Judith, um, also known as Judy, and what I'll refer to her is in the rest of the story, Johnson and her husband were one of those couples. Um, in the 1960s, the couple applied for adoption through they were like a work colleague and the clinic, but they like obviously had no idea like what this really was. So their instructions were, get to Georgia in 12 hours. They were living in Ohio. Come pick up the baby, sign the birth certificate, and head out the back door and leave town immediately. Because that doesn't sound shady at all, right? Mm, well, at least sounds suspicious. like <laughs> legit. But I suppose they were very desperate for a child, and they were getting one. So Dr. Hicks told them that the fee for this was $1,000 to cover the birth mother's expenses. When they went to Georgia, they brought home baby Melinda. So it was not until many years later when these crimes came to light that they realized Melinda was a Hicks baby. So they, when this was uncovered, you may have heard that term somewhere, but probably not. But it was a big scandal, obviously. And these babies, these 200 plus babies were known as Hicks babies. So in April 1998, let's fast forward, um, Judy and Melinda appeared on the Maury Povich show. <gasps> uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Atlanta, you were going to know Maury Povich. Okay, so in the hierarchy of, like, 90s talk shows, I mean, you have, which is really weird because she's obviously dominating headlines at the moment, we had Oprah 
who's still a goddess. And um, and then we kind of like went down to like, you had Jenny Jones, you had Maury Povich, you had- Jerry oh, Springer. What? Jerry Springer was like bottom rung, right? So they had these like middle guys, like the, they were all like the, basically the same show, just with a different, Ricky Lake, you had like, anyway, so all of those. Then like, yeah, scraping the barrel, you got Jerry Springer down at the bottom. So they appeared in the Maury Povich show on an episode featuring the Hicks babies. Um, but unfortunately, Judy would not get to see her episode air. Let's fast forward a couple of months into June 7th, 1998. Six-year-old Brooke Sutton was spending the night with her grandmother, Judy Johnson. Um, so Melinda also had a sister, and Brooke was her daughter. Now, Brooke stayed with Judy a lot as she helped look after, after her after school, and she would stay the night, um, you know, as many grandparents do. Brooke later said that it was a normal evening. She watched a show with Judy and then went to sleep in her grandmother's bed. However, she was awakened in the night. An intruder had entered the home and was attacking Judy. Brooke heard the noise and creeped out to the kitchen. She, she saw ma'am. She ran back to the bedroom, got under the covers. Now, really sadly, Judy was very brutally attacked, raped, and killed. The intruder then went to the bedroom and found Brooke and attacked her as well. Brooke lost consciousness, um, and she has, like, no memory of the attack she suffered. Thank goodness. Um, she regained her consciousness a few hours later at 7 a.m. So she went to the phone, and she didn't know what to do. She went to the phone. She called her neighbor. Obviously, her grandmother is, has died. The neighbor didn't answer the phone, so she left the following message. I'm sorry to tell you this, but my grandma died, and I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. Somebody killed my grandma. Now, please, would you get a hold of me as soon as you can? Bye. Which obviously <sighs> killed me. I have a six-year-old, so this just this whole story was just horrendous. So she didn't get anywhere with that. So Brooke then walked to her to a neighbor's house. She knocked on the door of Tonya. 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 It's like T O N A. Tonya. Uh, Braze. The neighbor answered the door and she looked at the child and she said she was cooking breakfast for her children and left the bruised <gasps> and bloody Brooke standing on the porch for 45 minutes <gasps> in her nightgown. No. Well, no. remember that. Remember that. Okay. So then she finally like, takes her home and then the police, it's her mom, and the police were called. So when the police questioned Brooke, she said that the killer looked like Uncle Clarence. Mrs. Johnson's 35-year-old son-in-law, Clarence Elkins. The police interpreted this to mean Elkins himself was the attacker. So obviously, um, Clarence is Melinda's husband. So Clarence and Melinda Elkins. Brazel also reported to Brooke's mother that Brooke had identified Elkins as the attacker. Years later, Brooke would, when she was a, an adult, she would say that she had grave doubts about the identification at the time, but just went along with it. I mean, she's six years old. She's just been completely mentally scarred. And she said, I just wasn't sure it was Uncle Clarence or not, Brooke said, but it, I was too afraid to say anything. This is when Melinda's life changed forever. The police came to her house, and in the same time she found out her mother had been brutally attacked and murdered, her niece attacked, they then arrested her husband for the crime. Melinda said, that pain was unbearable, and I just screamed, you can't wrap your head around that. They had Clarence in handcuffs in the back of the patrol car, and at that point, they took him, and he just never came home. So Brooke later described on, um, when she did interviews later in life, on Larry King, another show that's on, I think it was like CNN. I woke up, and I found my grandma dead. I went to the next-door neighbor's house, and I told her that it looked like my uncle, uncle Clarence, and it sounded like him. So she took me home, and she told my mom that. What I told her, and then everyone just started freaking out, and my mom and dad called the police. My mom and dad told the police it was my Uncle Clarence who did it. When asked how the identification could go so wrong, she also replied, well, I told people that it looked like him. And they just went with that it was him. They didn't even listen to what I was saying. Obviously, she was six years old. So Melinda was like, I don't, I don't buy it. Like, Clarence had a solid alibi. He was never alone that night. There was no physical evidence. And she just couldn't believe that after almost um, 20 years of marriage that he could be responsible for such a devastating act. So at the time, both Judy and Melinda had actually received strange phone calls for punishment after going public with the Hicks baby controversy. And so Melinda was like really already terrified. And that is kind of why I told you about that whole thing. 
Um, because she kind of thought, she's like, it must be, maybe it's something to do with that. Like, then she's scared that they're going to come for her. Like, it's all, it, it's all happening right around the same time. So at the trial, the prosecution theorized that Elkins killed his mother-in-law due to frustration because she was meddling in his then contentious marriage to her daughter, Melinda. The case against Elkins was largely based on the testimony of Brooke. Investigators did not find signs of forced entry or fingerprints or DNA leaking Elkins to the scene. So literally nothing. There were hairs recovered from Johnson's body were excluded as having either, either come from Elkins or Johnson. So they weren't the victims or Elkins. But yet, yeah, exactly. So he insisted he was drinking with friends until about 2.45 a.m. Sunday morning, a timeline that Melinda corroborated. She testified that she saw Clarence return home and she knew he remained there as she was awake most of the night because her son was sick. The attack occurred sometime between 2.30 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. And the Johnson residence was more than an hour away by car. So, like, the timeline doesn't add up. There's n- the, the physical evidence doesn't add up. No- nothing. Okay. So Elkins' alibi was also corroborated by his neighbors and friends. So his friends knew when he left. Jesus. His neighbors saw his car. Literally, you couldn't really that exonerate somebody. That stuff is somebody. so scary when you think of, so like, scary. what if that happened to you? And you have all this stuff pointing away from you and it doesn't matter. It's so bad. So... It gets so much worse. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So based on the testimony of Brooks, Brooke identifying him as her attacker, he was convicted on June 10th, 1999 of murder. Murder, attempted aggravated murder, two counts of rape by force or threat of force and felonious assault and sentenced to two f- terms of life imprisonment. So Melinda found herself all alone. Her mother died. Her sister and her family had completely turned their backs on her and wanted nothing to do with her at all because they thought she was lying and covering for Clarence. So obviously, you could see why that there was it was not going well. For a minute, I may have flopped into a ball, but I had two sons, and that was my main objective, was to take care of my children. I don't think I processed it for a long time. I just went into survival mode, said Melinda. So she made a vow to find out who actually killed her mother. So three days after Judy's murder, she made a list of suspects, and she came up with 12 in total. But she knew she was going to have to find a DNA match, as Clarence's DNA was already cleared and didn't match. So she's like, the key to this is going to be finding whose DNA matches. So over the next six years, she set about getting DNA samples from her list of 12. So she flirted with men at strip clubs and would pull out strands of their hair. So she'd track down her suspects, right, and... Follow them to the bars. Oh, my God. She'd pull out strands of their hair without them knowing. So she went there. She did, she'd take their beer bottles, their cigarette butts, and she kept them in preserved in her freezer. She wasn't sure at the time. She's like, I don't know how I'm going to get these specimens tested but or how long it's going to take. So her fr- freezer just became the laboratory of DNA samples, and she was going to figure this out. So she realized she needed help. She was on year four now of the six, let's say. So year four, four years had gone by. And she contacted a private investigator named Martin Yant. Now Yant was known to help with the exoneration of like n- like numerous wrongfully convicted defendants. He also urged Melinda, like it was time that she really needed to reconnect with her sister. Like you're not gonna be able to do this alone. So Melinda finally went to her sister's house after four years. And at first her sister sort of turned away, but then came back to the door and a reconciliation began. So Brooke, who was now 10, confessed her uncertainty, stating it couldn't have been Clarence. That person that hurt me and Mima had brown eyes and Clarence has blue eyes. So Clarence's attorney interviewed Brooke on camera, where she recanted her earlier implication of Elkins. Clarence appealed his conviction with the new evidence. The judge believed the child had been coached by relatives after the reconciliation, and the appeal was denied. So after the failed appeal, they decided, okay, really, it is going to come down to this DNA evidence. So the court ruled that Melinda could have access to the DNA recovered from the scene, but she would have to pay for the costs of the DNA testing. So Melinda herself raised $40,000 before asking the Ohio Innocence Project for assistance. They convinced a laboratory in Texas to test two samples for $25,000, which is half of their normal price. The results excluded 
Clarence Elkins, which we already know. Clarence appealed the conviction again on the basis of the new DNA evidence, saying, like, look, like, it's, we've tested it. It's been tested twice now. It is not me. It's not none of the physical evidence is me. So the court ruled that because a jury convicted him without DNA evidence, they would have convicted him even if it didn't match. So that appeal was denied. So they were like, it doesn't matter. Um, would they have they? I know. Mm. So, Melinda was livid. You two look livid too. Like, everyone's mad. We're all I'm mad. more livid at the fact that it costs that much money for a fucking DNA test. Right? Jesus. Okay. So, Clarence had been in prison for six years at this stage, all right? Now, one morning, so Melinda's obviously, like, at that point of, like, going back to square one with, like, I actually am going to have to find the actual person now because the other things that actually exclude him, they're just like, no. So, one morning, Melinda picked up a copy of an, um, the Ohio newspaper, the Akron Beacon Journal, on the way to work. There, on the front page, it was that neighbor whom Brooke had run to all those years ago. The neighbor who had made Brooke wait 45 minutes on the front porch before letting her in, Tonya Brazel. The story gave Melinda red flags. The neighbor, along with her partner, Earl Jean Mann, were charged with child rape of their own children. Oh. Um, Melinda had never heard Mann's name before, and as they weren't married, didn't realize Brazel had a common-law husband. She realized it had been forgotten that Brazel had actually left a bloodied and bruised child who was in need of urgent medical care outside for 45 minutes. Cops didn't think, that's weird. Like Suspicious. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Upon further investigation, Earl uh, Mann was actually a convicted rapist and had previous convictions for attacking the elderly. <sighs> and he's like across the street? Fuck's sake. Yeah. Earl Mann had been released from prison on the 3rd of June, right? Melinda says, was, went on to say, like, Earl actually went AWOL on the June 4th from his, like, halfway house and disappeared. Judy was murdered three days later on June 7th. Melinda began to track Earl Mann and discovered the terrifying realization that he was incarcerated at Mansfield Correctional Institution. It was the same prison where her husband, Clarence, was being held for Judy's murder. She could not prove it yet, but she was sure this guy is the killer. Melinda had been still collecting DNA up until that point. She realized it was man who was the killer. So she started trying to write him letters in prison to get him to write her back and, like, lick the envelope so she could get the DNA, right? (laughs) That was unsuccessful, right? Unsuccessful. He never would write back. So one day she finally came face-to-face with man. She went to visit Clarence in prison and told him she was sure it was him who was the real killer and asked if he knew him. Clarence emotioned that he was actually sitting right across the room. So Earl Mann had tried to buddy up to Clarence in jail. He'd say to him, like, I know you're innocent, and try to, like, shake his hand and be a buddy to him. Clarence said there's always something about Earl that bothered him, but he just couldn't, like, put his finger on it but didn't, also didn't want anything to do with him. But this strange coincidence turned out to be really a life-changing opportunity for Clarence because Melinda knew he, he had to somehow get a sample of Earl Mann's DNA. So I said to Clarence, you've got to go get something from him, Melinda said. And Clarence was really skeptical, but Melinda insisted that he's just, you're just going to have to steal one of his cigarette butts, all right? It's just, you know, there's no pun intended here, but you've got the man up. You're just going to have to go do it. Now, one day... He walked into the common area, and there was Earl Mann smoking a cigarette, and when he walked away, Clarence got his sample, he hid it in his Bible for two weeks, wrapped it in paper, sent it to his lawyer. The day after Clarence got the sample, Earl Mann attacked another inmate with a lock inside of a sock, and he was moved to another prison. <gasps> Jesus, this is like yeah. a movie. I know. It's like, so, okay. the DNA was tested against the crime scene DNA. It was a perfect match. So, Earl G. Mann, I'm going to talk about him for a minute. He was born in Melbourne, Florida, before relocating to Ohio. He had an extensive criminal record for crimes ranging from a racially motivated assault on another man to robberies. During uh, 2002, Mann was convicted of raping three girls, his daughters, all under the age of 10. He had three children. I know, I know. I just He had three children with Tonya Brassel, who lived next door to Judith Johnson, Brooke frequently played with her daughters. In 2005, 
after Mann was identified as a suspect, the Barberton police officer uh, brought to the attention of the prosecution the existence of a memorandum from 1999, four months before Elkins' trial. The officer arrested Mann for an unrelated robbery, and during the process of his arrest, he was drunk and belligerent, and Mann asked why he ha hadn't been arrested for the murder of Judy Johnson. Per so he basically confessed to it. Um, so per policy, the arresting officer sent a memo to the detectives working the Johnson murder. This statement was never disclosed to the defense. So after Mann was identified, Brazel actually admitted during questioning that Mann returned home the early morning hours of the murder with deep scratches on his back. When she questioned him, he claimed he had been with a wild woman. Um, according to Brazel, when Brooke knocked on the door following the attack, he became angry and insisted that Brazel not let her in or call the police. So Melinda Elkins has stated that she suspects Brazel may have also influenced Brooke's identification of Clarence. So Brazel was the first person to hear the six-year-old's alleged identification of Elkins, despite Mann's suspicious behavior that morning. She reported to Brooke's mother that after driving Brooke home, that the child named Clarence as the attacker. Um, and Brazel testified at Elkins' trial that the child had told her that Clarence was the perpetrator. So she actually help with all of this. So, all right, I'm going to get a little bit more mad, just one more time, okay? So despite the DNA evidence connecting Mann to the murder, the district attorney refused to release Elkins. Elkins' attorney contacted Ohio State Attorney General Jim Petro. Petro personally contacted the prosecutor, Sherry Walsh, on several occasions regarding this case. He similarly discovered that she was just not really interested in reviewing the case. Yeah. So Petro took to the like really unorthodox action of having a press conference. So called them all out in public at a press conference in order to publicly pressure the prosecutor to dismiss the charges. The prosecutors performed more DNA testing of Harris found at the scene. Again, man was identified. So finally, December 15, 2005, the charges against Elkins were dismissed and he was released from prison. Melinda and her whole family, including her sister and her niece, picked up Clarence that day. So in 2008, 10 years after the client, crimes were committed in a plea agreement to avoid the death penalty. Mann pleaded guilty to charges of aggravated rape and aggravated murder for the death of Johnson, as well as the aggravated rape of Brooke. He was sentenced to 55 years to life in prison and will not be eligible for parole, parole until 92, which... He really shouldn't be ever. But um, so it took Melinda seven and a half years to clear her husband's name. Um, unfortunately, Melinda and Clarence did later divorce. She said it was just really a lot to come back from. But and they have since remarried other people. Clarence went on to receive settlements in the millions from the um, Barberton police and the state of Ohio, which he absolutely <laughs> deserved. They've actually both gone on to work on cr in the criminal justice reform, and Clarence speaks around the country about the whole thing. So that is the story of Melinda Elkins. Jesus Christ. That is a, that's a, that's a movie. Yeah. I did discover that somebody has, I think, bought the rights to it because it's pretty crazy, right? Wow. <laughs> it's really scary, like you said, to think that that stuff can happen. It, there couldn't be more evidence disprove, like, proving it isn't him, like eliminating him as a suspect. And literally across the street is this is the killer. And they didn't even look into it or they just yeah. decided, oh, yeah, we're just going to throw this guy. Like, this is be easy. We got this. this is, I'm just going to close this case. This guy did it. Oh, God, it's so sad. It's one thing, you know, we watch so many Netflix documentaries where someone's in prison and evidence comes out and you're like, mm, I'm really not sure. Did they? Didn't they? Mm. But it's another thing when it's so blatantly like they've been excluded. And yeah, you, the, and they're still stuck there. That that's terrifying. It really is. It really is. That's a great story, though. Yeah, and also like fuck that woman for not not letting a child into the home. I know. Well, she's a monster. Obviously, she went had her own separate charges for letting her children yeah. be raped. That's horrifying. But um, that's so sad. I can't. I just can't imagine. I can't imagine. Poor six year old girl, forever scarred by what's happened to her, and then the guilt. I must imagine of knowing that you put your uncle away, not on purpose, but for something no, that they, lazy police work. 
Um, and you put him through that for seven and a half years of his life. It's just awful. So, well, I think that's all we have for today. Um, you can find all of my sources that I used in today's episode um, on our website, murderfriends.com. If you have any suggestions of stories or anything you want to share, you can email us at murderfriendspod at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, murderfriendspd, or Instagram at murderfriendspod. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.